Okay. So, new topic. Uh, the last topic that that we are going to cover in this course, and then uh, next week we will uh, do as many problems as we can to prepare for the final. So, um, to, uh, the string matching algorithms are, of course, very important uh, when you search for, say, a gene within a genome, or if you uh, search for a word in a body of text. But they are also important because the techniques used are uh, really interesting. Uh, prima facie, it sounds that this should be a very simple uh, task, but um, this is actually not the case uh, if the word that you are searching for, right, if the string that you are searching for is uh, sufficiently long that, uh, so long that it cannot fit in a single register, right, then comparing it against the reference uh, is um, obviously a tricky task that uh, uh, might prove to be, the brute force method just proves to be inadequate, right? Um, so, um, so, just to set the things up, um, we will assume that we have a, uh, an alphabet with the many symbols in total. Uh, and we can assume for uh, simplicity that these, these symbols are just uh, numbers from 0 to uh, d minus 1, right? So you simply map i symbol into number i, and uh, you are, in this way, you, are, are, um, you can work with numbers only. Okay, so now, um, a natural um, thing to do is, uh, and we will see it, that it, this is quite a useful strategy, for each string of uh, numbers, you can naturally associate a number whose uh, uh, digits in base D are precisely uh, B1 up to Bm. So if the string is B1, B2 up to Bm, and each of Bi is smaller or equal than D minus 1, you can think of these Bs that this is just a representation of a number in base D. Are you with me? Right? So for example, uh, the, the easiest uh, is uh, uh, sequence 1, 2, 3 has natural representation uh, 123 in base uh, 10, right? So uh, we, this generalizes, of course, to any base. Uh, and uh, so we can consider this uh, kind of natural number. Um, now, this number, if the sequence is long, uh, can be very large, right? And it cannot sit uh, in a single register. So what you do, we define, uh, first of all, we can compute it uh, efficiently. Uh, we know how to deal with polynomials, right? Uh, we can uh, compute it using the Horner's rule uh, to uh, reduce the number of multiplications that we need. And then what we can do, we can define a hash value for the string to be simply um, h of b, which is just this number, right, mod p. So it's a very simple strategy. Uh, you, first of all, you transform a sequence of symbols into a sequence of numbers in which i symbol gets mapped into number i, right? So once you have a sequence of numbers that are all smaller or equal than d minus 1, because d is the number of different symbols, you can construe uh, the sequence of numbers b1 up to bm as digits in base d. And consequently, you can associate this, uh, uh, the number whose digits in base D are B1 up to Bm. You can evaluate this uh, efficiently using Horner's rule. You get a very large number, but 
if you take, if then you choose a prime P that is uh, large, but um, we will see later uh, uh, such that D plus one times P is, does not exceed uh, the largest number you can put in a single register, right? So it's a large number because this will be a hash function, so you want to minimize the number of collisions, but um, you don't want it too large because you want this value h of b and the values computed from, from that value to sit uh, in, the, in a register of your machine, right? So now, what you can do is, so imagine you have um, uh, the usual perennial problem of lack of chalk. Um, boom, 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 boom. Sorry about that. Ah, here it is. So this is your longer string, right? And here is the shorter string that you are, want to figure out whether it appears uh, as a substring, contiguous substring in the longer string, right? What you can do now, uh, if uh, these are uh, the um, AS, AS plus one all the way to AS uh, plus, uh, which variable did I use, uh, plus M minus one if this string is of length m, right? So now <clears throat> for uh, this string of numbers, you can repeat exactly the same procedure. So you can cook up the number whose digits in base d are precisely these numbers, and you can find the uh, uh, remainder mod p, and then if you, so here you will compute so this is your string B, this is string A. Uh, you compute H of B, right, which is, um, you remember this is uh, uh, B zero plus, uh, how did we uh, order it? I oh, know it's uh, the other way around. So uh, B zero D to the M minus one plus up to B M minus one, the last digit and then you find mod p of this. But you can also compute h of a string, let's call it small a. What is string small a? It is, it is the string as, as plus one, all the way to as plus m minus one, and you can compute h of a. Now, once you compute h of a, and you can compare it with h of b, and only if they are equal, if the hash values are equal, then you do brute force comparison to see whether you have a, a match or not. And if, the, if they are, sorry, if they are not equal, then in all likelihood, because p is pretty large, it's not very likely that uh, the hash values will be the same, but uh, the strings will be different. So futile comparisons uh, element by element will done exceedingly uh, infrequently, right? Now, what do you think? What is the problem with this approach? So what is the strategy? You compute hash value of the string you search for, and then you compute for all shifts of the same length m, their hash values, and you search and you compare element by element only if the hash values agree. And I claim that this, uh, as you know, the claim is that this should be a good way of searching. What is a fishy uh, part here that uh, it's not clear whether it makes sense? That's okay because you can move, uh, uh, you move one by one. So for every S, you compute the hash value of the corresponding substring of length M. So if you fail, you will move here, and here you will do A S plus M and compute hash value of this, and you keep moving one by one. 
So what is the point of computing a uh, hash value, right? It doesn't seem to be, it uh, looks as a complicated operation, right? You have to form this huge number, you have to mod it out with P. Isn't it then simpler simply to compare element by element rather than doing that, right? So the trick is, and this is where recursion comes in, that you don't compute the hash values from scratch. So this strategy will work if and only if instead of computing the hash value of a string from scratch using this complicated operation involving large numbers, if you can somehow cheaply obtain it from the hash value of the previous shift. Right? And that's the trick. So instead of computing the uh, hash values uh, uh, from scratch, uh, what you do is you do the following trick. Okay, let's carefully go through, uh, through what is uh, on the slide. So h of this uh, substring of length m is uh, uh, the a corresponding number whose digits are as up to as uh, plus m minus 1 mod p. What you do is you multiply this by d. Okay, to give you, uh, let me ask you something. Assume that your task is the following. You have a long string of numbers say this is some financial data, and you want to smooth it out, how do we smooth out kind of noisy data? What do we take? <coughs> Averages. So our goal is to compute, to plot instead of individual values, averages of all S1 plus AS plus 1 plus plus AS plus M minus 1 divided by M. How would you do this efficiently? If you have computed one average, how would you obtain the next average? Would you sum all the numbers? No. How? Exactly. So the way how you would do it, uh, if you computed the average of these numbers, right, to get the average of the next string, all what you have to do is uh, you multiply this average by m to get this, then you subtract as, you add as plus m and divide everything by m. Right? You don't have to keep adding. This may be an average that involves, say, a, ha a string of 100 consecutive numbers. Rather than keeping summing up 100 consecutive numbers, you keep the tally and um, you simply subtract the first number um, of the previous uh, string because this will be dropped and add a new number and divide by m and you are done, right? So how would you use the same trick to compute the hash value here? Idea is that the hash value of any string and the next shift, shift that drops only as from the left and adds as plus m on the right, can be computed as follows. If you multiply d times h of as, what happens? You get d to the m as plus d to the m minus 1 as plus 1 all the way to d times as plus m minus 1. So all the powers of d increase for 1, right? Now, I keep the first one which uh, because I want to get rid of it, of it. 
Now, the part that is left is almost the hash value, except that the missing part is AS plus M, right? Because uh, on the line, oh gosh, above it, uh, on the line above it, um, the numbers go only up to AS plus M minus 1. Yes? D to, oh yes, ah, okay, you get extra credit, send me email. <laughs> well, look, it means you are paying attention. It's not free ride, right? Even if you find a typo in lectures, why is this good? It means that you read the lectures, which I'm not sure everyone does, right? So I give credit, extra I, credit for I every. You a typo and you didn't respond. Sorry? I emailed you a typo. That's because I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> I, I keep, I have a special folder and I just check in also uh, the justice will be done in due course. And Trump will be proven innocent. So, um, so that's uh, true. So uh, this is dm times as mod p plus h of uh, the next shift s plus 1. But then I have to subtract the very last element, which is AS plus M, and voila, this is now trivially computable. Now I can solve for HS, AS plus 1, and what do I get? What do I get? If I solve for H, AS plus 1, uh, modular arithmetic allows you to compute as if uh, it's just regular arithmetic, right? Uh, so uh, you get that h of as plus 1 is uh, d times h of as, which was on the left side, minus, uh, and interestingly enough, here it's correct, uh, it's uh, uh, as not as plus 1. Uh, and when uh, as plus m goes on the other side, it will change its sign. Now, notice d to the m is constant, right? It depends only on the number of symbols and on the length of the string that you are searching for, but not on what the strings actually are. So you can pre-compute d uh, to the m mod p, and voila, you need one multiplication, and now you can see uh, the uh, demand that d plus 1 times uh, uh, p sits in a single register because you want to make sure that d times uh, h a s plus a s plus m can sit in a register. We know that a s plus m is smaller than d, so this is smaller than d plus 1 times p. And uh, so you uh, reduced everything to one multiplication two multiplications and one subtraction and one addition, and then modding it by p to make sure you stay in range. So now, this is constant time, and it doesn't depend on anything, right? It doesn't even depend on the length of the strings, right? Uh, only what d to the m mod p is, Right, but uh, uh, this is all just uh, a few operations. So recursive computation, that's now where recursion comes into the play. So recursive computation, if you find the hash value of this, uh, uh, sorry, up to here, of this string, then you can easily find the uh, hash value of the next string with only a few operations, right? So this will be lightning fast, right? Uh, only computing the very first hash value will take some time, right? Because uh, you really have to go to, through this computation to bootstrap the whole procedure. You do the same for B, but after that, uh, uh, it's an extremely fast search. 
right? After that, it's extremely, extremely uh, fast search. So are you with me? Uh, do you understand how the algorithm works? Good. So it's a very clever uh, construction. OK. Uh, so let me ask you a question now before we move to the next method, which is finite automaton. Uh, so here, it was obviously crucial that uh, the string really had to be identical. One that you search, you, don't, you cannot allow any errors in the string. Assume that uh, your uh, gene that you are looking for is, say, a thousand long, and you want to allow say that there is one mutation that uh, at one place things can be different. Uh, how would you search allowing uh, a very small number of errors, but search without, with, ab about equally fast as if it was, uh, if it was uh, for uh, completely identical strings? Uh? by using exact, uh, the algorithm for ex exact strings. Uh, you see, this is a beautiful trick that is done in bioinformatics. You take your string, that is, your gene that is, say, a thousand base pairs long, and you split it into two of, of, of 500 each. And then you search separately from the left side and separately for right side. Uh, at least one of the two sides, uh, if there is at most one error, at least one of the two sides will be perfectly correct, right? So once you find it, you simply look to the right of it if it's the first half, whether you have a match, and uh, otherwise on the left of it. Uh, so simply by a pigeonhole principle, right? If you have a small number of errors, if you want to allow say, five errors, uh, what you do is you would split the string into six pieces. At least one of the pieces has to be verbatim correct, and you can search for that string and then simply check if this part is correct, whether on the left and on the right is uh, uh, what you have. OK, so this is... Uh, a small addition. So let's move to the next method, which is a finite automaton uh, method. So the idea is uh, that uh, you want to kind of uh, parallelize the search. If you have a failure, you don't want to start from scratch, right? So you build what's called a finite automaton, which is just a fancy name for a, a lookup table. So what is a finite automaton? Uh, well, it consists of uh, uh, a bunch of states, uh, right? Here are the states, because the string is of length uh, uh, 7 in this example. <clears throat> um, gee, I did not, I forgot to put, uh, ah, here it is. Uh, so look at the string A, B, A, B, A, C, A, uh, right? Uh, so it has two, four, six, seven letters. So your finite automaton will have seven, will have eight states, right? From zero to seven. And the meaning of the states is uh, how many symbols, what a partial match you managed to construct so far. So having uh, a state zero means uh, that you don't have any partial matches. Uh, being in state one means uh, you have one partial match. And you are given a transition table, something like this, uh, which Given the input, uh, what is the next character of the input? How the automaton changes state? So you have this kind of formal machine that uh, reads uh, your string uh, symbol by symbol. 
and depending on what you what it had what it sees and what state it is in it changes into another state and then moves to the next symbol so what is the the idea here you see for example if you are at state zero, so you have no match whatsoever at the moment, and you see a symbol A, well, this is a correct first symbol um, of uh, the string A, B, A, B, A, C. So if you see an A, the state will change into state one. If you see a B, or if you see a C, that's not legitimate uh, beginning of this string, so you will loop back to the state zero, right? Now, assuming that you are in state one, which means so far you matched one element, which is A, and if you see a B, so if you are in state one and you see B, you will go into state two because a, b is a correct prefix of what you are searching for. Of course, if you see a b, if you see, uh, what happens if you were in state one and you see uh, another a? You see, if you see another a, so this is now, the trick, you have two consecutive A's, that's not a match, but the, the last A can be used as a match of length one. So you don't start from scratch, right? You will, uh, if you see an A, you will loop back in the state one. Let there be light. Okay, so now, um, if you see, if you are in state one and you see B, you go to two. Now assume that uh, you see another B, then you have A, B, B. You, out of this A, B, B, there is nothing you can salvage, right? Because if you drop first A, uh, you get B, B, but that's nothing, right? Uh, so if you drop A, B, and you leave just B, again, that's uh, no good. So if you see either B or C, you will revert to zero. If you see an A, and you are in state two, you are in state two because you have seen A, B. If you see now an A, you will uh, go into state three, right? Uh, if, after, if after state three, you see an A, what do you have? You have A, B, A, A. You see, the trick is you always try to salvage as much as possible as partial match. So if you have A, B, A, A, what can you use out of that? You cannot use A, A, right? Because you don't have two consecutive A's. The best what you can do is to salvage one A. So from three, if you see A, you will go to state one, right? Now, for example, if you see, uh, if you see A, B, A, and then you see a B, uh, you will go into state four because these are four correct matches. Now, if you are in state four and you see an A, that's a correct continuation, you get to five matches. If you see now a B, so what is the string that you see? It's A, B, A, B, A, B. What is the best that you can salvage from that there? Let's see, so you have A, B, A, B, um, and then you see uh, A, B, A, B, a, B, and your string is uh, A, B, A, B, A, C. What is the best that you can salvage here as a partial match? It's A, B, A, B, because here it is, right? So if you are in state one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Uh, and uh, you, sorry, five, and you see a B, you will not go 
you will go back to the state three, sorry, state four, right? Because that would be as if you have seen A, B, A, B, right? Except that it is here. So you get the idea. So uh, you see, this kind of parallelizes the search as you are moving your string and looking for the matches. You keep track, your automaton keeps track all, on all partial matches within this string, right? Do you understand how this works? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, what if there's a, like for example, if you're in state C, uh, state three, state, and mm -hmm. you receive a C. If you see, okay, let's write this down and see what it is. Uh, so you are, You are in, uh, sorry, this is not my laptop. Um, so you are, you are saying we are in state three, so we've seen A, B, A, yeah? A, B, A, and then you say you see A, C. Okay, A, B, A, C, uh, A, B, A, there is no match. What can you salvage from here? Nothing, so from there, you will go from, if you see a C, state three will move you all the way back to zero, right? So each time you try, very good, very good. That's a crucial observation that even has, yes, that's exactly right. What you look is, the longest prefix that is suffix of uh, what you have seen so far. Yes? Can we change this to the MIDI machine so that we can have uh, one less table? Sorry, say it again. This is a more machine, right? This is, what do you mean more machine? Like finite state machine. Yeah? This is a more machine, like it doesn't depend on the input. But if we can change it to the MIDI machine, that means all of the output will be depend on the input. So we can have only six things. No, only well, yeah, you can do optimizations, but uh, this is kind of the core. Uh, I mean, the, yeah, of course, but, the, but this is kind of what is behind it and easiest to uh, visualize. Um, now, so the thing is exactly what you pointed out. Each time we have a mismatch, right? You always look, what is the longest prefix that is a suffix of what, we, what we've got? And this is where the machine goes back to, exactly. Now, building this table uh, takes time and uh, uh, it is not the most efficient way of doing things, uh, but your observation is actually crucial. It allows you to, um, uh, to do it recursively on the fly. Let me uh, tell you what is the, the idea. The idea is to use, uh, again, recursion on the fly. So say you have a string uh, um, say uh, one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, uh, say one, two, four, and then one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, four, right? So now you can recursively uh, do the following, you see. So here is the first place where you have a chance, but only for uh, this bit, right? Uh, the next chance is here, right? Um, so the idea is that if I have a match that uh, for, if I recursively, you see, if I know for a substring what is the 
suffix that also appears and prefix as prefix. Then in order to, so I can now use recursively here, right, uh, because this was previously computed, right, for this prefix, how it appears as a suffix. So for the larger string, right, if I fail with this one, I can simply call recursively my function and uh, uh, obtain uh, the, the, the match from the previously computed. So what is the idea here? You are essentially looking for self-correlation of your sequence, right? When uh, the, uh, the beginning, right, appears as a suffix here. So for example, here this appears, this whole appears here. And, um, uh, you know, actually, I, I, have, uh, uh, I have an example of this, but for some reason it didn't end up on the, on the slide. So what we are going to do, we will just finish um, uh, next time. Uh, I have a, a kind of graphic representation how, how this works in... Uh, stage by stage. Uh, so let's finish a little bit early and uh, we will finish it next.